Hi, so we're back on with the wind turbine. A lot of people have been asking about this wind turbine. Have I abandoned it? Well, no, because it takes time, remember, to do all this stuff. Now, I was busy um, collecting these things. These are the um, ballasts out of lights. And if you pull them apart, the bottom comes off and you can extract coils from them, a whole host of coils. And I was collecting these and extracting the coils. And then Sid came to the rescue. God bless you, Sid, you are a star. So Sid Sykes sent another package through of things from a microwave oven, including uh, an awful lot of turntable motors. And they're really easy to crack open. So I cracked open the turntable motors and got a load of these, which again are coils. And I've used these coils on this, and I've put about a quarter of the coils on. So the plan is to pull it apart and have a look at it, a look at it talk about it a little bit, put it back together and then give a quick demonstration. So that's the idea. So the rotor hasn't changed a jot actually and I've laid it on its side so you can see the magnet arrangement. But it's basically a big wheel, there's many magnets on the rim that I can fit and they go north, south, north, south on their faces out that way. And I just crammed on as many as there and put a load of um, filler around them to keep them in place as I could get on that wheel without thinking particularly about pole spacing. It's the stator that has changed. Now if you remember the stator previously it was a big square board and <coughs> I was having problems with the stability of the rotor on the stator which is why we had the casters. It was kind of acceptance of that lack of stability but doing something to dampen it and a lot of people made comments about that which I thought was um, very valuable actually but it also made me think a little bit about using the casters but still I liked that stabilizing uh, idea. Because in the last few weeks I've spent my time learning to weld and of course there are reasons that I've been learning to weld. One of the reasons I have a bit of fun building a bike, as which I will be doing in the other videos, but the other one was the worry about the stability of this. So what I've done is I've taken some really chunky bits of metal, as you can see right here, and I've welded them in a crisscross pattern. This steel is 3mm thick steel, industrial shelving that I chopped up into sections. It's part of that shelving that I found in a skip. So I've chopped them up into this X section, found a central pipe and welded the whole lot together as you can see. That pipe is now very much more stable and it's got these long legs to help stabilise it. And of course that helps stabilise the rotor as it turns, which is the whole point of it really. So this hasn't actually cost anything extra because I used it from scrap and my newly acquired welding skill. For those people who want to know the price of the welding rods, I used two of them and they're about 10 pence each. So I suppose it did cost me 20 pence. The other addition, of course, is this here, which is actually a Lazy Susan bearing. It's a big old ring bearing here and it has little rubber pads on it. So the thing sits on here, the rotor sits on that pipe and any extra little bits of wobble hit these rubber pads as cushions and then that Lazy Susan can rotate in the same way that the casters did but it's now a much more locked position. This incidentally will take 150 kilograms of weight on it. This weighs 19 kilograms so we've got plenty there in order to overcome any of that. Then as you can see what I did with that flat base is I cut this second ring which isn't actually fixed down yet and on this second ring are the ones that carry the coils. Now these coils are from our turntable motors. I could wind the coils if I want but there's a lot of coils it's quite a pain and I wanted to collect all the scrap so we did coil winding in a previous video but these ones have been collected from turntable motors. Now again no spacing has been uh, worried about in spacing those coils on this external ring. I've just bunged them on there. The fact that we've got no pole spacing here and we've got no particular spacing on these coils means that each coil really must operate independently. These coils are a very fine wire so even with the lightest pass they'll generate a huge voltage. At something like 10 RPM of that outer circle, this will generate about 15 volts. I mean, it generates milliamps, okay, but it generates around about 15 volts. And of course, what I've got here on each coil is a rectifier. I'll give you a close-up in a minute and we'll talk about the coil arrangements. But that's what I've done to um, change the design of the base, but not the design of the rotor. And the design of the base has changed, but the um, driving idea of the base has not changed. But let me give you a close-up of this. 
So each coil has its own little bridge rectifier, four diodes in a bridge rectifier configuration attached to a capacitor of, uh, I think it's 50 volts and a thousand farads, something like that. So each one of these subunits deals with itself as being its own little generator. What it does is output to the capacitor. So the overall generation is spread along all of those capacitors and they even everything out because they act as a sort of sink, a sponge for in and out to sink any variable and fluctuation. So each one of these generates independently, can't go back because it's going through a rectifier, goes into the um, capacitor at some fill or other. So if there's a difference in this fill, the speed of the capacitors means that the capacitor levelizes all of the output to two output wires over here, which is where we take our output from. So I quite liked that. I mean, maybe I've been a bit loony with it, but I actually really liked it as an idea, and it seems to be working quite well. So this thing will generate, and it generates, actually, at very low speeds. Now, remember, it generates high voltage. It generates high voltage deliberately to overcome the resistances of all of this. Because these wires are very thin and have high resistance. But with the high voltage, it can overcome that and actually push some energy out. Now, we don't have metal cores. And we don't have metal cores because we don't want the resistance between the metal core and the magnet to slow that thing down in the light breezes that this is actually going to be operating in. You have to remember when comparing this, the whole point of this is to do something different. Wind generators, they look at a specific set of circumstances. I think they're wrong in those circumstances because I don't think they match what we, what we actually experience in everyday life. They are meant for relatively high winds, which is why they produce such rubbish amounts. This is meant for low wind. So in low wind condition, we're not going to generate that much because it's low wind. So there's not that much energy available anyway. So it's much more of a scavenger. But I think it's scavenging the uh, wind that is available fairly effectively and as it can do that over a longer period of time I would think this would generate the same amount as energy over that period of time so if we took this for a year and compared it with the commercial generator what its output was over the year I'm willing to bet an arrangement like this would compete really quite favorably with it so here's a quick close-up of the coils and magnet arrangements so they're the magnetic ring and just underneath of the coils right here there are the capacitors attached to the coil. Okay, so we've got the same problems we always have when we want to do wind experiments. No wind, but somebody suggested this thing, a leaf blower. So I got myself a leaf blower, and I'm gonna put a leaf blower on it, just so we can see it spin. Now we know this thing spins, we've had it in the wind loads of times, but we're gonna put a leaf blower on it so we'll get some kind of spin out of it. Now I've been doing this a little bit, obviously, so we're reading about 2.5 volts at the moment, which is no surprise, it's all these capacitors. But let's put the wind blower on and watch that thing rise. It's now at 2.6 volts. 2.7. So, even though Sid sent me a load, obviously I still have the rest of it to do, so if anybody's got any spare turntable motors or wants to pick out these coils and stick them in an envelope and send them to me, they would be most gratefully received, otherwise I'll carry on collecting these. I wasn't quite sure which way I would go, but this seems to be awesome, so that's what I'm going to do. I'll, like I say, carry on using those. Now, you have to think about what this is. There's no point in looking at it as a competition against a commercial generator. It's just not to do with that. It, it won't compete in that space. A commercial generator is meant for a whole different ball game. It's a central hub and it's got a high torque and it will generate lots of amps if the wind is blowing. This isn't. This is a vertical design which is self-limiting. It actually goes for high voltage as opposed to high amps and it goes for high voltage because the forward drop then 
isn't so important as a percentage of output across those uh, rectifiers that we've used. Now we haven't put um, cores in these, and that's deliberate. We haven't put cores in these because we want this thing to spin as freely as possible. If we put some metal cores in those, we're going to get attraction between the magnets and the metal that the wind is going to overcome. We're looking for low wind performance, low wind, low cost performance. For that, we need that thing to turn as easily as possible. It needs to turn as easily as possible because in low wind, there's not much push to get it turning. Now, in a commercial uh, wind generator, there is a starting torque with those things. There's the same thing here, there's a starting torque, but it's much, much lower. And the reason for that is we have low winds. On average, our wind speed, like I say, is around about 12 miles an hour. We do get high winds here. We get high winds sometimes 25, 30 miles an hour. But we get them perhaps a week a year. We hardly ever get them. The bulk of the time is when that wind is very gentle and very low. And this is not so much a um, generator as really a harvester. And it's meant to harvest those low energy winds and those gentle winds that we get most of. So this should operate pretty much all of the time, even the lightest of breezes. That's the aim for it anyway. Now of course because there isn't much energy in that low volume wind, we're not going to get a huge amount of energy. We're going to be able to scavenge what energy there is at a reasonable amount of proficiency. So this will not generate hundreds of kilowatts, but then it's not meant to. It won't create the bulk of your load, but it will ease the burden of your load. And in order to do that, of course, it must be cheap. We can't make this for two to three thousand dollars. It has to be made for one to two hundred dollars. Otherwise, the cost is too high. So it's aiming itself at a whole different section. It's not really aiming at what the commercial wind turbines are trying to do. Now, in my opinion, commercial wind turbines sold for household use aim at a specific target and fail to meet that target. They generate best in a wind speed that in England we certainly just don't get. And I get endless uh, reports from people saying they've spent the money on these things and most of the time they generate somewhere between 50 and 70 watts. So if we can get 50 or 70 watts out of this, fantastic. If we can't, well, we've got to consider the wind that's pushing it. I mean, it's being pushed by very low wind, so it's going to get low power. But then that low power is extremely usable. It could be used, for instance, for doing something like lighting the lights in your house. So for all those people who want to criticise this in light of a commercial generator and what that aims at, in your criticisms, bear in mind the differences between the two generators and what the two generator types are trying to achieve. So we're trying to achieve something very different. We're trying to scavenge what energy there is from a low energy condition, which is far more predominant than generating energy from a week of high energy. I think that's a better way to go. We all make our choices, other people think different things, and I'm okay with that, it's just that this particular project has made those choices. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and thank you very much for watching.